Well, good morning all. Good morning. I hope you all had a good sleep. I had a great sleep. And also the team I was barracking for won, which is always a great help. But I did say to Frank this morning as I was walking up, I can't believe I agreed to do John 6. <laughs> because it's a, a particularly challenging chapter. So if you'd like to open up at John 6 and also open up your books at page 58. Okay. You can see immediately that it's a very long chapter. And even if you just have a look at the headings, remembering that the headings are there to help us by an editor, uh, the author didn't write these. So, and it begins with a feeding miracle. Okay. So we've got that from John 6, 1, all the way down to the end of verse 15. Then at verse 16, we've got another strange miracle, a water crossing miracle. Okay, and that takes us all the way down to verse 21. Then at verse 22, everyone gets to the same place. So we've got about oh, three, oh, two, three verses where all the boats get together and eventually they find Jesus. Then at verse 25, we begin a very long discourse where there's a bit of dialogue that goes on between Jesus and the Jews. Uh, but basically, it's, it's the discourse. It's often called the bread of life discourse. And this discourse moves in careful steps. Now, as Christians, the minute we hear our bread of life, we immediately think Eucharist. Now, I want you to just hold that thought because in the first part of the discourse, a lot of the talking that's going on about bread, bread of life, believing, teaching, all of that is metaphoric. It's an image, a metaphor. So, so this uh, bread uh, is, is metaf a metaphor. And behind it is a Jewish idea of wisdom. That wisdom is what really nourishes us. Okay, so I'm just at the moment giving you the outline, but the first part of the discourse is picking up a Jewish metaphorical idea that's transferred the image of the ancestors who ate bread in the wilderness, the manna, into Jews continuing to be nourished by the wisdom of God. And the image of that is eating the bread of life. Okay. Then, and here it is, it's in verse 51, just towards the end of it. When Jesus says, the bread that I will give for the life of my world is my flesh. Now, once we hit that verse, we move from metaphorical thinking, language, to Eucharistic. So once we start talking about eating flesh, drinking blood, We've shifted then to be sacrament. So it's got that sort of a development. Now, what we often do is think we're talking sacrament from here, the minute you start talking bread. But first of all, let's try and understand it in its Jewish context. So let's go back to the beginning <coughs> and it begins with an extraordinary feeding 
Now this is one of the very few things, very few scenes, that is found in all the Gospels. So we find this, uh, the account of this miracle, we find it in Mark, actually we find it twice in Mark, two of them, Matthew, Luke and now John. So this, is, this goes back to some historical event, some amazing feeding. But then in order to try and make sense of the event, every one of the evangelists takes the event and presents it through their own camera angle. I, I, I love teaching Mark because Mark does it beautifully with two feedings. One on the Jewish side of the lake, that's obviously for the Jewish people. And then he goes to the other side of the lake to Gentile territory and has the same feeding miracle, only now Gentiles. So it's a beautiful sequence of the movement from the Jewish world to the Gentile world. But that's another, come another year and do Mark. <laughs> uh, this time we're doing John. All right. Behind it all, as possibly you can see just looking here, is the memory of Moses. In fact, the minute we're in chapter 6, we're told uh, it was the Passover, verse 4, the Passover, the festival of the Jews was near. And Passover is the great celebration of liberty, uh, liberation, the memories of Moses, escaping from Egypt, uh, being led into the wilderness, in the wilderness being nourished by God. Remember the manna, yeah. the quails, finding water. And you know while all of that's happening, you know what the Jews are doing? Do you think they're going around saying, oh thanks be to God? They're not. They're complaining. Why did God bring us out into this wilderness to die when we could have been eating the flesh that was in Egypt? So this language of the complaining of Israel is also going to be part of John. Okay, this language of murmuring um, is also there. So, so we've got behind all this a very strong Moses story. Very strong. Verse 3 on the mountain. Pardon? Verse 3 on the mountain. Yeah, verse 3 on the mountain. Yeah, thanks Frank. Offer any thoughts you want to. <laughs> so, verse 3. Yeah, lovely. Have a look at it. Jesus went up a mountain and sat down. Now that's the image of teaching. Remember, you know, professors have chairs and bishops have chairs, a cathedral. Uh, cathedra in Greek is a word for a chair. And so the chair is the sign of teaching authority. So when Jesus goes up a mountain and sits down, he's sort of almost looking like Moses, with the authority of Moses. Keep in mind what Frank was talking about yesterday. The context for this Joannine community, who at one time were part of the synagogue, who were part of that great Moses tradition, who one time celebrated with their Jewish friends and neighbours and family the great festival of Passover. But now, towards the end of the first century, that's no longer possible. They are no longer welcome in the synagogue. And the pain of that can we still celebrate Passover? Or have we lost that tradition? Have we lost contact with our heritage, the Moses heritage? And not only have we lost contact with our heritage, have we lost the Passover God? Have we lost the God of the Exodus? That's a huge question. I mean, we had that God when we were part of the synagogue and part of that tradition. But as you saw yesterday with that word aposynagogos, we now are no longer welcome in the synagogue. So 
for all we talk about John as a theologian, he's a pastor. He's caring for the genuine needs of his people, of his community. And one of those needs is, have we lost our heritage? And so he shapes this, the memory of this event, this event of a feeding. John gives a particular shape to it that emphasizes the Moses tradition. As we've already seen, verse 3, going up the mountain, sitting down. We then have the miracle. I'm, I'm not going to go into the, actually what happens in the miracle in a lot of detail, just to point out a few things for you. Um, verse 11. Jesus took the loaves. Notice what he does. He gives thanks. In Greek, Eucharist, Eucharistane. So already the memory is being shaped by what is happening in the Johannine Christian community. They are already celebrating Eucharistane. They are already taking bread, giving thanks. And so this is the word we find here in John 6. Uh, at first in Mark, Jesus does the Jewish thing, picks up the bread and blesses it. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation, through your goodness we have this bread to offer. You know the words, don't you? That's a typical Jewish blessing prayer. But here John has gives thanks. Um, the language in verse 12 of gathering up the fragments... Again, there's a particular Greek word behind that. And it seems that in the early church, when they celebrated Eucharist, that's what they did. They gathered up the leftovers, the fragments, and they took them home. They could take them home to people who were sick, use them on another occasion. But the gathering up the fragments is, is quite significant, not only for the Christian community, but in terms of what happened to the ancestors. See, at the time of Moses, they were commanded to go out every morning and collect the manna, and they were told not to keep any of the leftovers. And those who thought, oh well, who's going to notice? and did it anyway, the next day it was all rotten. It had all perished. But here, this, this bread that Jesus offers, offers is not going to perish. It can be collected. It can be taken home. Imperishable. Okay. Uh, I want you to notice they gathered up the fragments of the loaves and they filled 12 baskets. Okay, again, this is a theological um, image of the whole of Israel, whole community. Uh, Christians would have seen themselves now as the fulfillment of a new Israel. So we've got here both a memory of what happened in the past, but now it's actually living on. Uh, not only for the Jewish people whenever they celebrate Passover, but it's been given a Christian framework for a Christian community. Now in response, look at what happens in verse 14. When the people saw the sign that he had done, they began to say, this is indeed the prophet who was to come into the world. Now on page 58, I've got something about that. About the middle of the page, you'll see Jesus like Moses. See that? Okay. And I've got highlighted, people recognised him as the prophet. Now here's the little quote from the book of Deuteronomy. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me, like Moses, from among your brethren. Him you shall heed, just as you desired of the Lord your God at Horeb, another name for Mount Sinai, on the day of the assembly, when you said, uh, Let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God, or see the great fire any more, lest I die. 
So the Lord said to me, I've rightly said all that they have spoken, I will raise up for them a prophet like you. So this was one of the expectations of the Jewish people, that towards the end times, towards that end time, that God would raise up perhaps a, this prophet. So they were thinking, this was part of the air. You know, yes, you heard the phrase, uh, it was in the air. Well, this is one of the things that was in the air. We're living close to the end times. Maybe now's the time for this prophet like Moses or Elijah or a son of David. Any of these saviour type figures that they had this living hope, this living expectation. So now they see what Jesus does. He looks like Moses. He teaches like Moses. He gives us bread like Moses. Therefore, he must be <laughs> the prophet like Moses. So they're thinking along those lines and they say, this is the prophet like Moses. And Jesus says, whoops, they're going to come and make me king. So because they're thinking we're in the end time, this is the time of the kingdom of God. We don't hear that phrase much in John, but this is that image of the end time when finally God's reign will come. Moses is one of the hopes around this time. Now, okay, end of that little bread scene. Then we go to the water crossing. Now again, remember what happened back in the, the Moses time, where the people come out of Egypt through the waters of the Red Sea, okay, or Sea of Reeds, but they're crossing through the waters, leading them to safety. So uh, the main thing I want to point out here in this sea crossing is what Jesus says in verse 20. He said to them, oh, your translation says it is I. Got it? Mm -hmm. Okay. Now there's a, uh, the, the Greek actually says this, ego, Amy. I am. And usually us biblical people like to capitalize it like that. Because that's the Greek equivalent of the personal name of God revealed to Moses. Back in the book of Exodus chapter 3 and then chapter 6, Moses, remember the burning bush story? Okay, so Moses comes and, and says, what's your name? And God reveals the, the mysterious name, oops, here we are, Yahweh, meaning I am who I am, rather mysterious. So that's what it looks like in, if you were writing it in Hebrew, well, when it was translated into the Greek, it's always translated ego, amy. So whenever we have Jesus saying things like, I am, that's the sacred divine name of Yahweh, now present in Jesus. So the sea crossing reveals Jesus as I am. So look at all the things we've got here. We've got all the things that happened to the ancestors at the time of Moses. They've had a water crossing. They've, there's the revelation of the I am, ego eimi, like there was the revelation to Moses. There's the wonderful feeding in the wilderness with the manna or the bread. So, so far we've set up the scene like the book of Exodus. Okay? So this people has experienced what the ancestors experienced at the time of Passover. Now I want you to take one minute and just talk to one another for one minute and make sure that's all clear. One minute buzz. <laughs> So while we're on page 58, 
And again, part of the Jewish world way of thinking at this time, where the, 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 is, the people of Israel have this extraordinary faith. When things get bad, it convinces them that surely God will act. So the worse it is, the greater the hope. Wonderful faith. And because things were pretty bad towards the end of, the, uh, of that time just before Jesus, they'd been persecuted by Persians, by Greeks, by Romans. They thought, God, it couldn't get any worse. God must be going to act. And so there's this great hope of the end times when God would come. And part of that great hope are these messianic figures like Moses, Elijah, son of David. And at this end time, other things were going to happen too. And one of the end time hopes they had was that once again, the heavens would open and the manna would pour forth, as it once had. And so on page 58, I've got another little quote there. Just uh, uh, the crowd's response, you can see it. Mm -hmm. And in the dark writing, I've got a quote from a Jewish book written around the same time as John's Gospel to Baruch. So it's, a, it's about contemporary with John. And this is, this, so this is Jewish thinking theology. And it shall come to pass at that self same time, so this is end time, that the treasury of manna shall again descend from on high, and they will eat of it in those years, because these are they who have come to the consummation end of time. Look at it again. The treasury of manna shall descend from on high, We'll eat of it in those days because they've come to the end of time. Now, that's the thinking in the first century. So when we move now, as we're going to, into the great discourse, so uh, where we are in our text, we're on to verse 25. When Jesus starts talking about the bread from heaven, uh, that's the background to it. This expectation, hope of an end time manna once again coming down from the heavens. Okay, so let's have a look at this. They found him on the other side, said, Rabbi, wh uh, when did you come here? Okay, and then Jesus says, look, you're not looking for me because of the signs, what you, uh, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. You're just after a free food. Do not work for food that perishes. Wow, important phrase this. The contrast is the food that perishes, that is, the manna, in contrast with the food that endures for eternity life. That food that lasts forever. So we've got this contrast being set up. And this food that is for eternity life is going to be given by one called a son of man. Now Frank I'm sure will mention this. But in John, this Son of Man title points towards the cross. It points towards the one who in fact is going to die. The human one. In whom the great revelation of God will be revealed. One who does give his life for the world. I'll let Frank, he's written a book on this, several in fact, so he can do this one. So then they ask him, well what do we do if we're going to get hold of this bread that's going to take us into eternity life? And Jesus talks in terms of believe. That's the work. Believe in the one whom he has sent. 
So we're in the language of belief. Okay, belief. This is wisdom language. So I love it. They say, verse 30, so what sign are you going to do? He's already given them two. <laughs> and here they were, well, we don't like those two. Give us another. <laughs> what sign will you give uh, that we may see it and believe in you? Then they give him this wonderful phrase, our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness. As it was written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. So they point to what happened to the ancestors as the great sign forgetting that that's exactly what Jesus has just done. And then Jesus says, look, it wasn't Moses who gave you the bread. It was my Father. That God is the one who gave the true bread from heaven. And this bread is coming down, look at the verse 33. The bread of God is that which comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. It's a bit like what we read yesterday in John 3.16. Greater love has... Oh, uh, give his life. God so loved the world that he gave his only son. So keep that phrase there too. In response, it's a rather positive response. So give us this bread always. Positive. Now Jesus takes them deeper. They're still thinking manna. They're still thinking real uh, food like the ancestors ate. And now Jesus asks them to make a shift into thinking about a whole way of life, which is what wisdom was about, a whole way, which is what the Torah was about, a whole way of life focused on himself, Jesus. He says, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Now, in the middle of page 60, are some of the wisdom passages that make the link or the metaphor of eating food is a metaphor for receiving living according to the way of wisdom. Now, let's read them. These are beautiful images. Proverbs 6. Wisdom has built her house. She set up her tables, she slaughtered her beasts, she's mixed her wine, she set her table, and she sends out her maids to call. Whoever is simple, let him turn in here. To the one who's without sense, she says, Come, eat of my bread, drink of the wine I have mixed. Lead simpleness and live. Walk in the way of insight. So eating bread is a metaphorical way of saying, walk in the way of wisdom. Follow the teaching of wisdom. So eating bread equals living according to wisdom. So eat bread is equivalent to, oopsie do, wisdom. Lost it. Here we go again. Book of Sirach, another one of the wisdom books. Come to me, you who desire me. Eat your fill of my produce. For the remembrance of me is sweeter than honey. My inheritance sweeter than the honeycomb. Those who eat me will hunger for more. And those who drink me will thirst for more. Whoever obeys me will not be put to shame, and those who work with my help will not sin. Whoever eats me will hunger for more. Those who drink me will thirst for more. And what does Jesus say in verse 35? Let's listen to it again. I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry. And whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Okay, so this 
wisdom language is very close to the surface of John. And the other one, also from the book of Sirach, that last little one on page 60, the one who fears the Lord will do this, he will hold to the law and will obtain wisdom. And she will come to meet him like a mother, like the wife of his youth, she will welcome him. She will feed him with the bread of understanding and give him the water of wisdom to drink. So this is the metaphorical language behind this part of the discourse. So Jesus talks about, um, I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of the, of the one who sent me, that I'll lose nothing. Raise it up on the last day. This is the will of my Father. Now, verse 41 the response, your text will say, the Jews began to complain. Uh, the, what have you got? Okay, complain. Hear the language of murmuring. It's the murmuring in the wilderness, uh, which happens in Exodus 17. You just might like to put a note there. Uh, and that takes us back to that whole experience of the people complaining to Moses. Why'd you bring us here? We got no food, we got no water. Murmuring, murmuring, murmuring. And they say, isn't this Jesus, the son of Joseph? We know his mother and father. So how can he say, I've come down from heaven? See, they're stuck. They're stuck at the human level. Now, we know because we've read the prologue where Jesus has really come from. So we've got some insight. Jesus is from God. Jesus is of God. Uh, verse 45, the theme is still that of being taught. So we're still wisdom language. Verse 47, it's still wisdom language. It's still about believing, following. I tell you, whoever believes, I, I love it here, look at the word has has eternity life. We're not waiting till the end of time. You and I already possess, have, present tense, eternity life. In the old days we called it sanctifying grace. Yeah. But I like eternity life. It sounds, to me, it makes much more sense. Sanctifying grace was, I thought, imagined it as something like milk. You know, <laughs> it gets poured in. So, uh, I mean, it was a nice image, but it didn't mean anything. Whereas eternity life has a sense of, wow, living into the very life of God. Jesus again in verse 48, I am the bread of life. In other words, the way of life, the way of wisdom, the one in whom you will find this eternity life that you're longing for. The one your ancestors wanted, but all they got was the bread in the wilderness and they died. So the contrast between what they happened to the ancestors and they died and what following Jesus can mean and it's eternity life. Now, again verse 51, I'm the living bread. Okay, now keep that in mind. This is still Jesus trying to speak of himself as one who's come from God to offer life. When we get to the end of verse 51, the shift happens between bread and eating bread as a metaphor for following Jesus. Got that? Yes. All right. Now, if you were one of Jesus' disciples, Peter, James, John, uh, Martha, Mary, Lazarus, all of those people, you had no problems. There was Jesus, you could go to him, you could express your belief in him by literally following him. Seventy years later, how do you follow Jesus? Today, how do you follow Jesus? And see, this is what takes us into how is John's community and how are we 
also going to have access to this following of Jesus that will lead us to eternity life now where is it that we can encounter can meet Jesus how do we do it we didn't live 2,000 years ago and this is where John now takes us into the language of the sacramental experience of the Christian community this is where we and John's community living at the end of the first century they too can have an encounter with Jesus and follow him let's look at what's going on the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh now remember what I said yesterday about flesh flesh is what will ultimately corrupt so it's a way of speaking about death the end so thinking biblically this is flesh it's not going to last forever ultimately you could um, burn that the pages will wear out so anything that's created in biblical terms is corruptible will not last forever so is flesh so here we're talking I will give for the life of the world is my flesh this is where that's going to happen might do one of these now hmm done all that great oops where that's going to happen that's where Jesus enters into death that experience of flesh that's common to all of us verse 52 the Jews then disputed among themselves how can this man give us his flesh to eat one of the other things that happens here is we get a change in the Greek the verb that's used you know in English I can talk about eating okay or I can talk about uh, chewing munching <laughs> well up until now the verb that's been used is eating generalized but now it becomes very graphic a very physical verb is being used quite you know using your teeth really getting into it real crunching munching chewing it's that sort of a thing so this is real eating going on here and they ask how can this man give us his flesh to eat and now Jesus makes it even worse I tell you unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man there's that language again of entering into Jesus death and drink his blood now if you know anything at all about Judaism you know they do not eat meat with blood in it okay they drain the blood out very deliberately why because blood is life blood is the, the, the sort of the life of the animal and life belongs to God so the way I read this is that by eating the flesh and drinking the blood means we are entering into the death yes and the life the resurrection this is where Christians later than the original community this is where you and I can enter into the Jesus experience of his death and resurrection in Eucharist this is where we meet 
and can express our belief and our following of Jesus through the sacrament, through the symbol. And you know, if ever you hear anybody say to you, oh, it's just a symbol, you know they haven't understood it. There is no just about a symbol. A symbol is the reality. In the only way us humans can access it. The symbol is the reality. And some realities we can't touch, see, smell, but they're real. And when they're like that, we can't see them. We have to have symbols. Think of a marriage. What does love look like? I don't know. But in a marriage, there are real things that happen. Touch, taste, smell, put it on your finger, that say love. We need symbols to express the most deepest parts of being human. The very things that make us human, that we can't see, touch, smell, the symbol is the reality. So when we eat the bread and drink the cup, drink the blood, we symbolically, in the only way you and I can, enter into that experience. Today, it's not a dead memory, it's not nostalgia, it's that word Frank was talking about yesterday, it's a zikaron, it's a presence now, now, and that's what Eucharist is. Of course, at the time, some of the, Jew, the, some of the Jews find this too hard a saying. So verse 60, many of the disciples heard it and said, this teaching's too difficult. How can anyone accept it? And that's, that's the issue, isn't it? It is a difficult teaching. It's not easy. And some walk away from Jesus and some stay. There's that choice. And verse 69, Peter says on behalf of everyone, Lord, who else can we go to? You have the words of eternity life. You have the words of eternity life. So it's a powerful chapter. It's pastoral. It's trying to help that community say, we have not lost Passover. In Jesus, we have the experience our ancestors had when they crossed the sea, when they were once fed in the wilderness. And we've got it even better because the bread they ate corrupted. But the bread Jesus offers is for eternity life that we're living now. So it's that transition from what was in the past but now has come to its fullness in Jesus.